Today we sit down with Dr. MJ Malloy, epidemiologist, researcher with the BC Centre on Substance Use, and the recently appointed Professor of Cannabis Science with the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. As the principal investigator of the ACCESS study, MJ Malloy studies the factors which underlie the health and well-being of people living with HIV who use illicit drugs in Vancouver's downtown Eastside neighbourhood. Using data from this study, he observed the beneficial effects of cannabis use on the amount of virus in participants' bloodstreams. In recent years, his research team has also focused on the use of cannabis for people living with substance use disorders. During his academic career, he has published more than 150 articles in scientific journals, including studies in high-impact journals such as The Addiction, AIDS, and Lancet. So we have to sit. <laughs> they'll they'll let that roll in the cast too. By the way. Oh well, yeah. Oh yeah. So no, we have the pleasure of uh, sitting with the newly appointed professor of cannabis, the the canopy growth professor mm -hmm. of cannabis. Yeah. Out at uh, University of British Columbia. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it must be nice to be recognized for work that uh, you've been doing for many years. I mean, work that's sometimes maybe not uh, appreciated enough. Yeah, I, I, you, know, you know, I think uh, a lot of a lot of that makes uh, there's a lot of things that make me happy about about the professorship, and, and and one is is the recognition for for the pioneers that came before. You know, no question, uh, before legalization, cannabis science was almost impossible, right? Uh, uh, but there were a lot of people who per persevered. You know, Mark Ware, who's uh, who's with Canopy now, um, uh, did the first clinical trial involving cannabis in Canada. Uh, took a tremendous amount of effort um, to, to do that work. And, and so I'm really grateful that, uh, that we now have a professor of cannabis science, uh, and, and in part that professorship really recognizes the people that came before. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I said it at, at the speech, uh, you know, scientists, we all build on what came before, and, and, and there's a lot of folks who, who, uh, who suffered a lot and sacrificed a lot to, to get us where we are today, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to be part of that. Nice. Yeah. Before I came in uh, this morning, I uh, pulled up the vision statement mm -hmm. that you had on the U U University of British Columbia Faculty of Medicine page. Ooh, I should have seen that. And uh, it says, it states your aim is to contribute to evidence-based efforts to support the health, well-being, and human rights of members of marginalized and vulnerable groups. Yep. In particular, people who use illicit drugs, those living with HIV AIDS, people who are homeless or unstably housed, and prisoners. Yep. What I'd like to know is, where did these altruistic principles come from? Like, how did MJ Malloy get to this place today? <laughs> What's uh, your th that's a mystery. Uh, you know, I I'm exceedingly lucky. I'm exceedingly fortunate. Um, I, I started uh, my working life as a journalist uh, in Montreal in the early 1990s, mid-1990s, um, and uh, was fortunate to work there for a couple of years. Uh, journalism is uh, a tremendous profession if you're someone like me who is very interested in how the world works. Uh, to have a social license, to be able to go up to anyone and basically ask them questions was for me a wonderful um, opportunity. Uh, and living in Montreal and, and being exposed to the, 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 the ideas that I, that, I, that, I, that I was exposed to there um, really gave me um, uh, the, the idea that I wanted to uh, learn more about about HIV, people who use drugs, you know that that aspect of the pandemic, uh, and so I went back to school uh, in 2003 or so, um, and, and was fortunate again, uh, you know, first of all that I had a family and a wife who who were going to support, you know, being a 30 year old guy going back to university to get a degree. Not, not a lot of people have that opportunity, so I, I was very grateful for that. Kudos, though. Yeah. Well, well I mean, it was. Mm -hmm. Moving back in with the folks, right? Mm -hmm. Going to sacrifice. Going to first year undergrad courses with 18 year olds when you're 30 or so and you've already had a career. It was, it was a bit odd, <laughs> uh, but I was lucky to be able to do it, um, and 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 lucky to to end up here in Vancouver. Uh, my mentors and supervisors, Dr. Wood, Dr. Kerr, um, who I now still work with here at the BC Center on Substance Use, uh, were tremendously supportive um, and, and allowed me to develop the idea that that science could be a force for, for good uh, for people who are drug users or prisoners or homeless uh, because that's what they've done in their careers as well. Uh, and, and so very fortunate to be able to follow those ideas to, to where they've led me today. There was a clip that I watched uh, a couple of days ago. I think you were doing a TEDx. Okay. presentation maybe it was a couple of years ago coming mm -hmm. up for a couple of years ago and you were making mention of uh, the first time that you heard a woman uh, 
speak openly about having HIV mm -hmm. and how that impacted you, mm -hmm. how that made you feel. How did that make you feel? Uh, I grew up with, um, um, uh, with chronic disease. Uh, my, my mother was sick with multiple sclerosis when I was, when I was a kid uh, and, and died from that disease when I was 12. Uh, so I think I've always been very aware of, um, uh, uh, of that sort of suffering. Um, and, and certainly uh, uh, to, to have that sort of physical suffering compounded uh, by social isolation and social marginalization for me was, um, uh, was a very challenging thing to hear, right? Uh, and I think we've moved past that a bit with people living with HIV, but I think it's still a reality that there are people in our society who are essentially lepers uh, through no fault of their own. Uh, and I think it's terrible, I think it should change. Uh, and I think that people who use drugs, uh, people who are, who are dependent on opioids or, or, or crack or cocaine, uh, there are society's lepers. Uh, and I don't mean to put, I don't say that to put them down, mm -hmm. but rather to recognize that uh, our society does not treat people with addictions all that well. With dignity. Uh, with dignity. It doesn't treat them with dignity mm -hmm. in most respects. Uh, our prisons are full of people with addiction, and I think that's wrong. Uh, I, I think that people in that situation um, deserve access to health care. Uh, they deserve access to the highest quality health care, uh, and, and that's really why I do the work that I do. As an epidemiologist, mm -hmm. in, your, in your work into AIDS research, you found, you, you found a link with cannabis yep. that was actually changing their, what's the word I'm looking their for? Their disease. It was literally changing their, their disease. Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, that, uh, that's, that's the closest I've come to a sort of eureka moment as a scientist, right? Um, because we, Evan and I, uh, had heard about work done um, uh, by colleagues in New Orleans uh, who, um, who, are, who, um, who investigate uh, the interactions between HIV and substances. And uh, so they use monkeys, uh, and the advantage of using monkeys for this is that uh, humans take, you know, 10 years or so um, to, to go from infection to death uh, if they're untreated. Uh, monkeys, it happens in the space of about a year. Wow. Uh, and so uh, scientists have used monkeys as what we call a model organism to try and figure out how HIV works. And these, uh, Dr. Molina and her crew, they're, they're interested in, in the sort of how uh, substances interact with HIV in, in, a, in a person's body. Because one of the hallmarks of the HIV pandemic is that people who use substances are traditionally worse off in terms of their disease. Uh, and uh, uh, for all of my career, um, my idea was that was because of the social aspects of it, right? And so they don't get as good health care, they don't get Nutrition. Right, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, but um, uh, uh, Dr. Molina's crew, they're, they're interested in, in how uh, substances interact on a biological level. And that's not something I ever really paid a lot of attention to. So they took the monkeys and then they, um, uh, they uh, uh, infect them with HIV and then they give half the substance and the other half placebo. And for alcohol and opioids and I think even cocaine, what they found was that the monkeys on the substances did worse biologically, right, than the monkeys uh, on placebo. But then they tried cannabis. And so they got about 16 monkeys, eight of them, uh, they gave uh, daily injections of THC. The other half got daily injections of sugar water or placebo. And they in experimentally inoculated all of them with HIV and then they watched what happened. And they expected that the monkeys on cannabis would do a lot worse, just as they had with the other substances. What they found was the reverse, was that the monkeys on THC had lower amounts of virus in their blood and survived longer than the monkeys that were not on, on cannabis, on THC. So we thought this was really interesting, right? Uh, and then we thought to ourselves, well, could we see if the same thing holds true in humans? Obviously, we can't experiment on humans in this way, right? That would be unethical for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but the study that I run of people living with HIV who use drugs, uh, for a, 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 about a tenth, of, about one in 10 of those participants, we have records on them before they got HIV. So that's what we did. We went back to the records around when they became infected. Lo and behold, we found that the ones, the people in that group who were using cannabis at least once a day had lower levels of virus in their blood compared to the people that didn't. And the only explanation for that is something that HIV, or something that cannabis is doing to the HIV disease process in their bodies. We don't know exactly what is going on. Um, 
but it was certainly enough for, for me as a scientist to sort of sit up and take notice. What year was this? Uh, 2014, 2013. So would you yeah. say that this is work that Dr. Ethan Russo would be with the work that he's doing, looking into it, would be able to maybe have a better ability to pinpoint exactly what's going on? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, Ethan, I mean, Ethan's a neurologist. He's, he's not an immunologist or a virologist, right. but he's also the, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Okay. So if anyone's going to have Do a good it. idea about what's going on, it would probably be him. Um, and certainly talking to some of my colleagues in those sorts of areas, I mean, they suggested things. You know, we know that uh, cannabis is an anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. uh, HIV is a disease that largely um, exploits the body's inflammatory processes to, to, um, to replicate. Okay. So we have a feeling that by turning down the body's inflammatory process, there's less uh, uh, material for HIV to replicate within. So uh, not, a lot of, um, not a lot of clinical implications for that work. You know? and, and so whenever I talk about it, I, 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 I do want to emphasize that people shouldn't be going off their HIV meds and right. trying to control their disease with cannabis, because we're certainly not at that sort of stage, and I don't think we ever will be. Um, but very interesting to sort of think about what the implications for this are. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, in terms of quality of life, uh, in terms of um, a lot of the other side effects and symptomology of HIV that people living with HIV deal with, uh, very interesting findings. So all the work that's been done down at High Hopes over the last couple of years, Sarah yep. Blythe, that they've been doing, there's been evidence that's been gathered. Some people say, well, it's anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you're now in a position to be able to build upon that. Yep. Take these findings. Yep. And we're, we're, we're legalized now in this, in this country, and yep. now you're getting the funding. Mm -hmm. What does it look like from here? Like, what's, what's your approach? How are, you, how are you guys laying this out as far as the clinical trials that you're going to do? And yeah. explain that. Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, I try and think of it in sort of two pieces. I mean, the, the, the one piece is certainly the clinical trials piece. Um, because that really is scientifically the only way to, 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 to answer the question uh, uh, of whether or not cannabis could have therapeutic benefits. It's the sort of the, the scientific bar, right, that a lot of clinicians um, especially uh, look to uh, in terms of their evidence-based practice. So we think it's very important uh, to, to do clinical trials uh, to try and answer that question uh, of whether or not cannabis could be helpful in these situations. Certainly, though, from Sarah and from the people uh, uh, that she's working with, uh, lots of evidence from them that this is helping. Uh, and, and so in addition to the clinical trials, we want to also do an evaluation of her, of her program. Uh, not only to try and understand better um, uh, what role cannabis is playing in their health and well-being, but to get some clues as to what per specifically is, is, is most beneficial in what sort of circumstances. One of the, the real drawbacks or one of the real limitations of, of cannabis science currently is this idea that there is a thing called cannabis, right? There isn't, right? There is THC, there is CBD, there is strains, there is uh, uh, edibles. So there's, a, a, as you know, a huge, vast diversity of what cannabis-based therapies could be. Uh, but here in science, we haven't really begun to tackle that diversity and understand that diversity. And so that's, that's one of the, the, the things that we hope to do through, through working with Sarah, is understanding better uh, you know, what specific preparations might be best for folks in that situation. And also to document what she's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I do think that given there are so many communities throughout North America, throughout the United States and Canada that are, are suffering, uh, and so many people that are suffering with opioid use disorder, uh, you know, generating and documenting evidence of what her harm reduction intervention looks like, I hope could be helpful for other places. Um, other places that have legal cannabis, uh, other places that are maybe even illegal, illegal cannabis. We've seen how oftentimes harm reduction interventions have to uh, uh, go against the grain uh, to, to serve people uh, and to open more spaces for harm reduction in communities. So those are sort of the two bits that we're focusing on is doing the sort of the observational work with Sarah, and then doing the clinical trials uh, to, to develop that sort of clinical evidence. Well, if you're interested, we would like to talk further after we do this about what, the work that we'd like to do with uh, Solid Outreach in Victoria. And, Great. And I spoke with Mary Lou Gagnon and, and we spoke with Bernie... Uh, Bernie, Bernie Pauly? Bernie Pauly. Great. Yeah, yeah they're great, great people. Yeah, they're great so, people. Uh, they've got a great organization there in Victoria. We awesome. really like the work that they're doing. So great! I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, this maybe possibility for some more work. Yeah. Um, 
something that comes up in conversation with us all the time, and that's the willful, ign willful ignorance that's perpetuated and put forth by politicians and policymakers, yep. and that's still embraced by uh, many people within the medical profession. What's it going to take to change this, and, and why are people still putting up such a fight when there's so much anecdotal evidence that is there? Anecdotal, yes, maybe, but yep. it's strong. Yep. Yeah, I think it's an unfortunate reality that 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 for people uh, uh, in in that for people living with substance use disorder, um, the stigma that they experience in the healthcare system is a reality. Um, uh, certainly, you know, in the work that we've done here at the BC Center on Substance Use, uh, we've 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 tracked or we've investigated the role that that stigma plays, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of, of hospital settings, a lot of clinical settings, remain drug-free zones. One of the first signs that you go when you go into my hospital, uh, the hospital that, that that we're a part of, is that it's a drug and alcohol-free zone. Uh, and, and that's automatically stigmatizing mm -hmm. for people who are uh, who are people who are using drugs, uh, and for people who are are using cannabis. Uh, and so I think you know those sorts of attitudes should change. Uh, I think we should replace the sort of the the, the abstinence-based policies with more harm reduction-based policies, so that the focus is not on on preventing drug use, which we all know is 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 a fool's a fool's errand, but on trying to help people who are using substances to reduce the harms that those substances may play in their life. Uh, and I think as well for cannabis, we have a really unique opportunity uh, because here's a substance which, you know, decades of research, uh, not as much human research, but certainly for the preclinical work, the lab rats and the, the test tubes, you know, have really shown that there is a great potential for benefit. Even if you only look at it within the sort of the box of, of medical science, of clinical science, even, you know, leaving aside all of the tremendous patient testimony that we have. Um, even if you just look at the, the, the bare bones, very boring, basic science, uh, there's tremendous potential uh, and, and tremendous benefits that have been identified with cannabis. Uh, so that's the sort of the work that I do as a scientist is try to advance that. Uh, and, and hopefully, and one of the, 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 the things that I'm trying to remember uh, is that so often in my field, the advances uh, are, are thought up up by the people who themselves, right? People who use drugs themselves. That's how we got needle exchanges. That's how we got safe injection sites. That's how we got all, a lot of the sort of the advances were because people said, hey, this, this ain't working. Why don't we try this, right? And I have to ask, you use cannabis? Yes. Okay. Both medically and non-medically. Okay. Um, and- um, Have you been stigmatized for it? In the past? No, I'm a. <laughs> in the past? I'm an upper middle class white guy. I don't get okay. stigmatized for a lot of things that okay. I do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have I been stigmatized for cannabis use? No, no, not that, not that never I felt remember. it. Never felt yeah. it. No, never felt it. Um, and so I think that you know, as a scientist, to try and remember that, try and approach things humbly, mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly remember that that uh, people who use cannabis uh, and the people in the industry are are tremendous sources of, of inspiration and knowledge that uh, I think can only be a resource for scientists and, and, and scientists who are trying to understand uh, the, the possible role of, of cannabis in people's health and well-being. Um, so that's how I try and look at things. Um, which is not to say that we don't need sort of the highest quality evidence and, not, and, the, and the best scientific mm -hmm. approaches. I would argue that the testimony of patients uh, demands it, that we should treat those ideas and treat those experiences with the respect they deserve uh, and, and try to figure out how we can go about you know, figuring out what is the role for cannabis in, in clinical science. Yeah, and I think that's an important place to start as well, is that we're all drug users, right, in, in, in yes. one sense or another, right? 99% of us probably wake up and have a morning coffee or a morning tea or something like that. <laughs> that's substance use. Sure. Right? We, we don't think of it that way, and it's not, um, and coffee, I mean, doesn't have as many risks as heroin use, for mm -hmm. example. But certainly, I think we should all recognize that with probably very few exceptions, everyone in society is a drug user in some way mm -hmm. or another. Uh, and, and I try not to place any stigma or blame or, or derogatory feelings around that. Um, uh, you know, I think what we do need <clears throat> is, is a much better understanding of the risks and the benefits for each substance. Uh, and that's what we've not had for so long with cannabis, right? We've, we've had a society telling us that it is um, the source of deviance, uh, addiction, uh, of all these negative connotations when in fact the science has suggested that this not, isn't really so. Uh, we also haven't had a chance to develop what the possible benefits of cannabis might be 
uh, because of that prohibition mindset and prohibition framework. So that's sort of where I start my work, right? Is to try and say, okay, this is you know this is the science uh, in essence. Um, what possible benefits might there be for this for this substance, uh, and and how can we try to to increase our understanding? So that we put in place ways of using cannabis that minimize the the the, the harm, such as they are, and maximize the benefits. You know, that's that's really how I see my my work. Now that the uh, the road has been opened up with legalization of cannabis, mm -hmm. how long do you think it's going to take our government to um, to decriminalize all drugs? Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, you know, uh, certainly, I have been. Um, The idea that we put people in cages for drug use, I think, is something that has to has to end. Um, I, I think all the evidence indicates that that incarceration of people who use drugs uh, doesn't work in terms of uh, uh, stopping drug use, and it has massive unintended negative consequences. Um, one of the primary driving forces behind the HIV pandemic is the incarceration of people who use drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, it means that they uh, are more likely to engage in the sort of risk, risky behaviors that transmit HIV, uh, and they're less able to get the, the, the harm reduction and the medical care that will allow them to, 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 to keep themselves healthy and prevent onward transmission. That's just one small example. Uh, uh, and, and so I think that uh, this society, we have to have a serious conversation about decriminalization. Um, I think the legalization of cannabis will hopefully provide a bit of a, a framework, uh, a new framework for the society to talk about drugs so that we prioritize public health uh, and, and we give up this idea that through public security, through police and prosecutors, we can get rid of drugs. I think that's an unrealistic, an unrealistic and in many ways an unwanted goal. Um, but it's going to be challenging uh, because certainly, uh, 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 you know, this viewpoint of decriminalization, I imagine, is not the majority at the moment. Um, uh, but I think times are changing. Right? I think the recognition is that the, the war on drugs uh, has not worked, um, despite the trillions of dollars that we spent over the years. Uh, and so hopefully that will cause more people um, to think twice about what our, what our, um, what our options are. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, I hope that legalization helps uh, to show people that, hey, <laughs> you can make a change in this, in this, in this, in this sphere. Uh, and then the next day, the sky is still blue and the sun still comes up and you know, it's, not a, mm -hmm. it's not a disaster. And in fact, there are benefits to it. Um, there are economic benefits, there are social benefits, and there are even medical benefits. Economic benefits, you uh, posted on your Twitter feed, uh, you reposted. Yep. Uh, in 2015, the White House came out and said that they are now exceeding $500 billion a year to the opioid crisis. Yep. $500 billion a year. Yep. So who's got the interest? I mean, they must see that there's a lot of money to be saved here if we, if we start implementing the right changes, mm -hmm. right? And it's, yep. You, you know some of the right changes that need to be implemented right now. Yeah. There's a lot of money to be made by those, or money to be continued to be made by those who don't want to see these changes being made. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, reality um, that certainly the status quo has, mm -hmm. uh, uh, has, has economic benefits for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, people who run private prisons in the United States do not want to see decriminalization. Uh, because it's quite clear that the criminalization of drugs and the criminalization of people who use drugs uh, helps fill their prisons and, and satisfy their shareholders. Uh, I don't think this is, a, this is a radical or a shocking statement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we have seen, for example, uh, in some states in the U.S. that had legalization, both medical or non-medical legalization of cannabis, uh, some of the people that spent money to oppose those initiatives were uh, pharmaceutical drug manufacturers. Right. So there, you know, there's, there are interests on both sides. Um, but from a taxpayer's perspective, mass majority of people here within Canada have everything to gain from focusing on the work that you're doing and helping alleviating the problems that opioids are causing. We're talking millions and millions of dollars, yeah. so hopefully they'll see it. I wanted to touch on something that comes up in conversation with us all of the time. It's at the heart of what we do. And it's, how did we get here mm. in society? I mean, there's a lot of people hurting out there. There's a lot of, there's reasons why people are turning to opioids and all kinds of drugs. Yeah. How did we get here? And how, and how do we, how do we 
deal with that problem? Is it one step at a time? Is it simply, you know, we got one person, MJ Malloy, doing the work that he's doing <laughs> in one area? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think you're right because I think that the, um, the the underlying problem is that the opioid crisis has has revealed a lot of the um, injustices in our society, um, and uh, the the crisis itself is a very complex, uh, uh, interrelated problem that uh, you know it's not going to be solved simply by. Um, cannabis legalization, for one thing. I mean, I, you know, I'm hoping that there will be a beneficial impact uh, to cannabis legalization, as we've seen uh, in other places, uh, on the opioid crisis. Um, but there's a whole, you know, um, uh, uh, raft of underlying factors that I think need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, workplace violence, workplace accidents, for example. We know that a lot of people uh, in the downtown east side, as one example, uh, end up there because of chronic pain. Uh, and they have to use that they have to resort to illicit opioid use uh, to to manage that chronic pain uh, a lot of that chronic pain comes from workplace accidents uh, and so taking care of working people <laughs> that's not a very popular uh, 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 that's not a very popular um, uh, idea these days uh, with the decline of the un union movement and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff but that's obviously one element of this mm -hmm. um, childhood trauma uh, you know, we know from our research in, in the downtown east side that, that far too many of our participants report to us that they had, uh, they had terrible experiences of childhood trauma, physical neglect, social, uh, sexual abuse, all that sort of stuff uh, uh, as children. Uh, and we know uh, the terrible effects that that can have on, on people, uh, on, on children as well as adults, um, if that sort of trauma is not addressed. Um, so that obviously goes to our educational system, our, our, our social welfare system, uh, all sorts of systems. So it's, it's, it's simply not a, uh, we have an opioid crisis, let's get people to stop using opioids or let's give them something else. It's, it's about, I think, addressing the needs for opioids and addressing the needs for pain relief um, and, 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 and trying to, to figure out ways of creating a, a more just, less painful society for, a minute to, for, more, for more and more people. Uh, I think we do have a very alienating society. Um, uh, we're a society undergoing tremendous change um, and, and that um, is, is difficult uh, uh, for many people. Uh, it's not a society with a lot of equality, uh, and it's a society with a tremendous amount of iniquity. Uh, and and this, is, this is on display in the downtown east side. You know, here we have folks who are, who are doing the best they can with uh, oftentimes a very terrible lot in life. Um, and, and, and drugs, uh, I think, are, are used because they make a lot of sense. They relieve pain. Uh, they keep you alert uh, if you're homeless, if you're looking out over your shoulder all the time. Uh, they, they, they make a lot of sense. Uh, but of course the cost to that is too often dependence. Uh, and, and, and so I think that uh, trying to, to provide people with harm reduction uh, as a first step to keep them alive, to provide them with treatment for substance use disorder so that they can try and break out of these, these quite terrible conditions, it, it's an incomplete effort, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, what these people also need, in many cases, is uh, a fulfilling job. Uh, they need a place to stay. Uh, they need contact with their family and their community and their culture. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's all a part of the solution. Um, you know, I'm focused on cannabis because I think it can be a really important harm reduction tool. Uh, I think that its potential as a treatment for addiction has, has, not, been, um, uh, uh, has not been well studied. Uh, and, but I think that our efforts here will be incomplete and our efforts in society will be incomplete if we don't also address those root causes, right? Um, housing and, and education and all those sorts of social things. That's what makes a healthy community. Mm -hmm. It's not the right cocktail of drugs. It's, it's, it's the sort of the, the equality and justice that more and more people can, can enjoy. That's, that's the secret to health, I think. Do you think the work that you and others are doing are going to be able to, once and for all, say that cannabis isn't a gateway drug? Well, I mean, it's hard to prove a negative. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think we have um, uh, uh, we have shown through our work um, that for a lot of people, it's the reverse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we published a study showing that folks who are at risk of of beginning to in, uh, inject drugs, uh, if they were using cannabis, they were less likely to start injecting. 
Uh, and that certainly points, I think, to the fact that a lot of people um, um, use cannabis to try and control their other drug use. They use it as harm reduction. Uh, they see it as, as more natural than other drugs and so therefore more uh, desirable in certain situations. You know, I think the gateway hypothesis um, is, is uh, attractive to a lot of people because it's, a, because it's attractive in the same way that simple solutions to complex problems are always attractive, right? Um, you know, I think, you know, you know, as a parent, obviously you're very concerned about your child's sort of trajectory through life. Um, and, and obviously the, you know, alcohol and drugs and the role of substances in, in, in young people's life is, is very concerning for a lot of parents. Uh, I think latching on to the idea that cannabis is a gateway and it's that, that's the cause for drug use and not uh, other things I think is very attractive to a lot of people. And, uh, but you know, we've, we've shown scientifically or science has shown quite generally that, that it's not really a, a hypothesis that, that holds a lot of water. Um, getting rid of it though, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure science Possible. is up to that task. I think that's more of a cultural or a social question. Fair enough, fair yeah. enough. Um, I do want to give props to Canopy Growth. Mm. They've stepped forward, they've, you know, they've taken a beating out there in social media. I mean, we Definitely. read all the blogs and, well, I mean, from the people that are far, oh, I'm going to say on the ones who are just, whether any LP, right, right? and yeah. it doesn't matter what they've done or the good that they're doing, they, they are all like, I wouldn't buy their product, I wouldn't, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm a guy that comes from way over there. Right. I am, and I'm yeah, yeah. old school, homegrown, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But taking a look at what they've done, stepping forward two and a half million towards, you know, UBC, another yeah. 500,000 that came in from the government. Yeah. Um, they've definitely been the company that I've seen that's taken the lead yeah. on many fronts. Yeah. Um, what is it about Canopy that, <laughs> no, seriously, you know you're there, you, you've seen them, they're, I mean, they're giving to you. What is it about them that sees such a need for doing this? And when is when are we going to see the government stepping up and giving that same money towards this? When are they going to equal that that spending, or or are they? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to have to continue to be funded from companies like Canopy and others that are coming in? Yeah, I mean, my my experience with Canopy has has largely been with Hillary Black, uh, who who, as I said at the event, has long been one of my heroes uh, for her work, uh, you know, starting the Compassion Club all those years ago and. Uh, and having that bright idea uh, and having the courage of her convictions to, 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 to develop that idea um, for, for, for these many years. Uh, so I think a lot of um, the benefits or a lot of uh, uh, Canopy's actions uh, are a result of her initiative. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, I think that you know, we've seen um, uh, some funding from the government for research, uh, some funding to support harm reduction. Um, obviously, I'm a bit biased, but I think more can be done. Uh, uh, if it takes private individuals, private companies to step up to fill that gap, I think that's great. Uh, but I think, you know, the, I think it, sh it, it needs to be said again and again that the opioid crisis is the defining public health mm. crisis of our age. Uh, too many thousands of our fellow citizens have, have died. Uh, too many families have been torn apart. And then there's people that are just barely holding on for every yeah. those thousand. You've got tens of thousands yeah. that are just holding on. Yeah. And so I certainly, you know, I, I, I salute Mr. Trudeau for, for, uh, uh, his, uh, for, uh, for his support of harm reduction. Uh, let's not forget we had a prime minister not that long ago who was against any form of harm reduction, uh, who set us back far too long. Uh, in harm reduction in this country. Mr. Trudeau changed that. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, you know, kicked off legalization. Um, and, and so I think we should be, ver we should be very grateful for those moves. Uh, but I, I, I will not hesitate to say that more should be done by the federal government, uh, by the provincial government, by the municipal governments, by all governments mm -hmm. uh, to address this problem. Uh, and, and I think the way forward lies in evidence. Uh, you know, we know that safe injection sites work. We know that methadone works. We know that not enough people in this country have access to those two things on a daily basis. That has to change. Uh, and, you know, I think we've got possibilities with cannabis, uh, with other new treatments, um, to provide better care for people with opioid use disorder. Uh, it's got to be full speed ahead on all these things. Um, uh, and so that, I think, this is the role of the government. MJ Malloy, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.